Our next step is to turn from continuous time second order differential equations to discrete time second order linear recurrence relations. Now these are going to look just like the second order linear differential equations that we have seen in discrete time. This is going to be of the form a times xn plus 2 plus b times xn plus 1 plus c times xn set that all equal to 0 since these are autonomous. Just as we did in continuous time, we can write this out in terms of the shift operator e. In this case, there is going to be a quadratic operator in e of the form a times e squared plus b times e plus c times i. You apply that operator to the sequence x and you get 0. Now, just as with the continuous time case, there is a characteristic equation associated with this shift operator. It is of the form a lambda squared plus b lambda plus c equals zero. And the general solution to this second order linear recurrence relation is going to be a linear combination of a pair of basis solutions. Xn is going to be expressible as C1 times phi1 of n plus C2 times phi2 of n, where C1, C2, those are constants that are going to depend on things like initial conditions. Phi1 and phi2 are the discrete time basis solutions to this second order linear recurrence relation. Now, just as before, there are going to be three different cases for these basis solutions depending on the roots of this characteristic polynomial a lambda squared plus b lambda plus c equals zero. Let's call those roots lambda one and lambda two. The first, the simplest, the best case is when you have real distinct roots lambda one and lambda two different from each other. Then the basis solutions are phi one is lambda one to the n and phi two is lambda two to the n. The next slightly more complicated case is when you have real repeated roots. In this case, phi one is just lambda to the n as you would expect. Phi two is n times lambda to the n. See how well that compares with the continuous time case? Okay, third case, if you have complex conjugate roots, if your lambdas are of the form alpha plus or minus i beta, then what do we do? Well, this one gets a little more complicated and it's best to express things in terms of the polar representation of these complex numbers. Remember that we can write a complex number in terms of its modulus that we might call r, because it's, it's kind of like the radius. It's square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. And then we can look at e to the i theta, where theta is that angle, arctan of beta over alpha. Just expressing this in terms of that polar representation and saying that lambda one and lambda two are r times e to the plus or minus i theta, that's really helpful. That magnitude argument expression allows us to very concisely say what the basis solutions are. They are phi one equals r to the n cosine of n times theta. Phi two is r to the n times sine of n times theta. That's it. That's our basis solutions. Very, very nice. Just as with the case of continuous time second order systems, these discrete time second order recurrence relations are really representable as first order linear systems on a planar or two dimensional vector of variables. Let's let y be e x, that is y n is really x n plus one, the shift of x. I take the vector variable x, y, I hit that with the shift operator at time step n. That is really x n plus 1, y n plus 1. But what is that? Well, x n plus 1 is clearly y n by definition. y n plus 1 is x n plus 2, which by that second order linear recurrence relation is minus c over a x n minus b over a y n pulling out the coefficients of this 
linear function gives us the matrix with rows 0, 1, and negative C over A, negative B over A. That matrix is applied to the vector X, N, Y, N, and that's it. We have our linear system of the form E, X equals A, X, where A is this matrix 0, 1, negative C over A, negative B over A. And now we know the solution to that. X, N, Y, N, that's really A to the N applied to the vector of initial conditions, X naught and Y naught. Now in the simplest case, where we have distinct real eigenvalues, lambda one and lambda two, with eigenvectors v1 and v2, what is this? We take the matrix of eigenvectors, v1 and v2 as columns, and then we've got the diagonal matrix, lambda one to the n, zero, zero, lambda two to the n. Then we post multiply by the inverse of that eigenvector matrix, we apply all of that to the vector x naught y naught of initial conditions. That is it, that is our solution. A solution that if we take the first row of it, we get a linear combination of these two simple basis functions. That's it, that's the story. It's the same story in both continuous and discrete time when you've got a second order linear system. Basis solutions, really, really helpful but they come from the matrix algebra.